Uh, yeah, thank you all for that welcome, and I'm really glad to be here with everybody. So, um, yeah, let's get started. Um, this is Psalm 113, and I think we can safely say that the point of this psalm is to praise the Lord, right? We heard praise the Lord at the beginning, an explanation for why we should praise the Lord, and then praise the Lord at the end. And actually, um, the uh, Psalm 113, along with the next few psalms up to 118, is called the Hallel, which just means praise in Hebrew. It's where we get the word hallelujah, which is Hebrew for praise the Lord. And if you look at the whole book of Psalms, in Hebrew it's called the Tehillim, which is the book of praise. So Psalm 113 is about praise, praise, praise. But now we've got to ask, what's the big deal with praise? Why is praise so important? Well, it's because it tells us what we're all about. I mean, why do you praise something? I mean, think about it. Something incredible happens, you see something beautiful, you have an amazing experience, and you just can't keep it to yourself. You feel this inner compulsion to go and you tell somebody and share it, right? So um, I'm not much of a sports guy, but I know that if you are in the basketball stadium and Steph Curry sings a three-pointer for the Warriors, everybody praises, right? They're up, they're cheering. <laughs> <laughs> loud noise. I mean, that's praise. We're having a communal praise event for that three-point shot. Or, you know, if you love food, like this Thanksgiving, there's something about, you know, you got good food, you got good company, you got good drink, but you don't complete the feeling of the goodness until you can say, mmm, that was good. You know, compliments to the chef. That is what finishes it. For you. It's just natural. It comes right out of us. And I had this happen to, to me. You know, I said I'm not much of a sports person, but I am a theater person. And I went and saw this show. And, you know, I, the actor was not a celebrity. The show was like, not a show I can remember the name of, but it was a really intense and complex character. And you could tell this actor was working and just putting it all out there. And it stuck with me. I was thinking about it walked across, this was in Dallas where there's parking lots and cars, so I walked across the parking lot, got into my car, and I had to get out of my car. I had to go back. I had to find this guy, and I had to say, look, that was amazing. I had to praise him for what he had done. And C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, he says this is exactly right. He says in his book, The Reflections on the Psalms, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy, because the praise is not merely expressing, but it's actually completing the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. And the Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. So what we enjoy, we praise, and what we praise, we enjoy. Each one completes the other, and that means praise is really important because it tells us about our joy. And God wants us, and he even commands us to enjoy him so that we praise him and to praise him so that we enjoy him. But how do we do that? Well, Psalm 113 is going to tell us. First, it shows us praise. What is praise? It shows us what it is. Two, it hints that we have this problem with praise. And then three, it's going to give us a solution to our problem with praise. So what is praise? What's our problem with it? And how does that problem get solved? So the first point, Psalm 113 shows us praise. And I'm going to go back through the psalm. I think it's 435 in your Bible. Uh, we're going to do the first four verses, and it's going to tell us what praise is, who should do it, and what it should be like, actually. So listen to the who and the what as we read. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. So, what is praise? 
basic question. We can even just go to the dictionary, and the dictionary says that praise is actually kind of similar to, this, to the word prize, you know, as in I prize this treasure above all else. It's also part of the word to appraise, you know, if you go get something appraised, you go learn its value, you go learn its worth. And this can be really important, actually, learning the worth of something. Um, this was just in the news, because it just sold, but four years ago, this woman went to the thrift store in New Hampshire, and she was looking for old picture frames. She got a $4 picture frame, but it just so happened to have this picture in it. And she said, hmm, that's an interesting picture. I don't know what its worth is. I should go get it appraised. And she took it. It was an original N.C. Wyeth illustration, well-known, um, if you're into that sort of thing, it's a well-known American painter, and it sold for $200,000. So I'm not telling you this so you can go make money at the thrift store, because I don't think you will. I'm telling you this because it's so important to know the value of something. And Psalm 113 says we need to know the true value of God. He's not just a $4 painting. He's much more valuable than that. He's worth everything, okay? And that's what calls us to praise. But then who should praise? Well, Psalm 113 calls on the servants of the Lord to praise him. And that clearly means Israel, God's people. But you can see, it's not even just hinted, you can just see that this praise is supposed to go international. Because you can see that it says he should be praised both now and forevermore. So God should be praised at all times. And then it says God's name should be praised from where the sun rises all the way over to where it sets. So that means God should be praised not only at all times, but also in all places. And finally, it says that he's going to be exalted over the nations. And that's a Hebrew word. It's Gentile. It means everyone who's not a Jew. So if the servants, the Jews are called, and all the non-Jews are called, that means everyone is called. So if you're doing the math, God is supposed to be praised at all times, in all places, by all people. So who should praise God? The answer is everyone. Finally, though, what should we praise? And Psalm 113 is a little specific. It says three times that we're supposed to praise the name of the Lord. That's interesting. Why not just praise God? Why praise the name? And it's also the word Lord in all capital letters that appears in this psalm. That's God's personal name. It's his covenant name. It's the one that he only shares with his people. So we are called, you know, the same way that my name is Alan, God's name is Yahweh, the great I am, the Lord. And this should really blow us away. It should, it should make us pause because God is not on a first name basis uh, with anyone but his people. There's no other God who's on a first name basis with his people. God isn't like, hey, that's Mr. God to you, sir. <laughs> God welcomes us in. He gives us his personal name because he wants us to know him the same way that he wants. Uh, he wants us to know him the same way that he wants to know us. And that's amazing. And then to really know God's name, to know anyone's name, is to know what they stand for. What's their reputation? What's, what have they done? You know, we know Steph Curry's name. I don't know him personally, but his name stands for those amazing three-point shots, Right? What does God's name stand for? Well, we're going to learn a little bit as we keep on going through, but that's his name. That's why we worship and praise his name. But all this worship and emphasis on praise might uh, give you a little hint that we have a problem. See, the same way that if your mom tells you to clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, it's probably not because your room is already clean. <laughs> if God is saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, maybe we have a problem with praise. And that's our second point, that we do have a problem with praise, and we need to figure out what it is. John Calvin, the great 16th century reformer, he put it this way in his commentary on this very psalm. He said, we all acknowledge that we are created to praise God's name, while at the same time, his glory is disregarded by us. So we all know that we're supposed to praise God, but we discount his glory. Calvin says our hearts aren't in it. We know what we should do, we just don't do it. You know, we could be so-so, we go through the motions, but we don't recognize his glory or his worth. 
And you have to go elsewhere in the Bible to see this, but I think our problem is that we're either too high to praise God, or we're too low. We're either too rich and powerful and wealthy and well-off, or we're too low and beaten down and hurt. As Proverbs 30 says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? We may be too high. Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. We may be too low. So let's go through that. First, we could be too high to praise God. You know, this may not be your problem, but we do live in one of the richest countries in the history of the world. And we live in one of the richest cities in the richest country in the history of the world. So this is a part of our culture. Our culture feels very safe, very secure, very wealthy, very powerful, in spite of different things that are happening. We can usually say, ah, you know, I've got it. <laughs> and when all's going well, it's just a fact of life, we forget God, right? We pray to him when we need something. When we get it, we stop praying, we stop praising. This is typical. This is how we all are. You know, our money and our success can make us feel exalted. We don't need God anymore. We say, who is the Lord? You know, we're like King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. He stands on his balcony and says, Is not this the great Babylon I have built by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? But even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. We may not be the most powerful person in the world right now, like King Nebuchadnezzar was, but we're prone to this temptation. On the other hand, though, we could just be too low to praise God. Maybe you identify with this one. Instead, you know, New York is not only home to some of the richest people in the world, it's home to some of the poorest people in the world. We have great inequality and that makes life really hard. Suffering and poverty and addiction and homelessness can really make it feel like it's impossible to praise God. Not only, it's not because we feel above him, it's actually we feel so far beneath him. We feel like God doesn't care about us, that maybe we should take things into our own hands and dishonor the name of God. We can just feel like we're too small or too broken or too messed up for God to notice. And why would you praise someone who's forgotten you? Or even worse, maybe you think God is punishing you and you wish he'd forget you. You know, you can feel like the speaker of Psalm 88. He's praying to God and he says, From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. So you could feel too low to praise God. But to see the real reason that we have a problem with praise, we actually have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, and it's actually here, with Adam and Eve, that we see the root of our problem with praise. You see, Psalm 113, verse 5 asks, Who is like the Lord our God? The answer is supposed to be no one. No one is like the Lord our God. But you remember what the devil said to Adam and Eve. If you don't know, he said, you can be like God. You can be equal to him. You just have to discount his glory. You just have to disregard who he is a little bit. And you can have all that. And they did it, and it brought sin into the world, and it brought pride, and that pride makes us both too high and too low to praise God. And you may say, hey, wait a minute. Okay, I get being proud because you're so powerful. But can you be poor and suffering and proud? And I'm just here to say that the Bible says with all due respect that yes, actually, you can. Because suffering can make you think that God no longer cares about you. That he no longer is in control. Or that God no longer knows what you need. And I just want to say very gently, if you think you know more about God's care and control and plan for your life than he does, then that's pride. 
It's a very sneaky sort of pride. It's the kind of pride that can get all of us. See, we actually all have the same, this pride is why we can feel too high and too low on any given day. So this happens to me. This happens to all of you, I'm sure. But there's pride in both, and we have to see that if we're gonna see the solution. Pride can just steal our praise. It's our main problem with praise. So we need an answer. And how does God answer it? Well, good news, God always has an answer, and Psalm 113 says, here's our solution. Let's read the whole rest of it from verses five to nine. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who saves... Oh, we can do it together, that's great. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust, and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. So can you see God's solution? If we're too high to praise him, God is much higher. He's so high that he has to stoop even to see the very tippy top of the heavens. We need telescopes to see up there He's got to bend down and squint. That's how high he is. So if we feel too high, he's higher. But if we're too low to praise him, God is so much lower. He comes all the way down to intervene and to save. And that changes everything. Look, let's look at both things. Let's look at the fact that God is higher. It's the first explanation for why he's so worthy of praise. And it's the first part of the solution to our problem. Why do we praise God? Because he's exalted on high. And that means that no matter how rich and powerful you are, you have no excuse for not praising God because he made everything and he keeps everything going. And in Hebrews 1, it says that he holds everything together by the word of his power. And if we stop to think about that, that's amazing. Have you all been to Rock Center and seen the statue of Atlas holding up the globe? He's bending down. You can see, you can almost see the sweat coming out of his forehead. And that's just to hold up the Earth. The Earth is a speck in our solar system, which is a speck in our galaxy, which is impossible to see in the entire universe. And God holds up all of that with just a whisper. That's how powerful, how wealthy, how high God is. And that is what's going to humble us and free us to praise him. But then second, and notice actually, this is where the psalm spends most of its time. It says, he's high and lifted up. Good, we got that covered. Let's move on and really explain how he is low and he is with the people he saves. So it spends most of its time on that. It says he raises up the poor and needy and he rescues the lonely and the brokenhearted. And just uh, before we kind of analyze it, there's a couple things that will help, I think. There's, there's history to the song, and then there's the imagery. And they're both kind of far away from us, right? This was written well more than 2,000 years ago. So let's look at these quickly. Psalm 113 is written actually about Israel coming back from exile in Babylon. The, they had been captured, they had been oppressed, they had been taken away from their homes. And they were in exile in a foreign land for about 70 years. Then God delivered them and brought them home. And this psalm was written as a way to celebrate that. And this rescue was so um, archetypal, so significant for the people of Israel that they quickly connected it to their first big rescue, which was the Exodus, the Passover, the escape from Egypt. So this was a psalm that they would use on a regular basis, but especially during Passover. This was always sung during the Passover, and it actually still is sung at Passover today. So this is a salvation song. It's part of their history, and they're saying every year, God saves. It's connected to what he's done before, and he will do it again. But then second, we need to know this imagery, because, you know, what are the poor doing in an ash heap, and what's with this childless woman? I mean, how do those things tell us about praise? Well, the answer is that the poor and the dust and the needy and the ash heap and the barren woman are all symbols of absolute poverty and despair. 
You can't get lower than the poor man whose bed is the sidewalk or the needy person who lives in the garbage dump. And that's actually what the ash heap is. Ashes were what you uh, made, uh, that was your garbage, and you would just take it and you'd dump it out. And if you were living in the garbage dump, you were really low down. You were in pretty big trouble. But that is where God goes. He goes into that garbage dump and he lifts these people up and he doesn't just take them to a middle class neighborhood. He puts them on Park Avenue, right? He sits them with the royal princes of his own people, of his own family. And then the childless woman, that's another picture of hopelessness. It actually may be even more tragic than poverty back then, because in ancient Israel, like most ancient societies, if you didn't have kids, you didn't have a tribe, and if you didn't have a tribe, you didn't have farmers and warriors, you were just going to get wiped out. So a childless woman, that was the only way that she could excel back then. That was the only way that she could contribute, was by having children. And if you couldn't have them, you were a burden, you were ashamed, you were cut off. You were socially ostracized. And so to see God come in to even that and lift her up, put her in a household, give her all these children, it's an amazing picture of rescue and restoration. So we see God here. He is saving the poor. He's rescuing the lonely. And we sing this psalm because we know that he's going to save us too. Or we should know that. But I want to tell us how we can know that. And it's because we actually know something that the writers and the singers of Psalm 113 didn't know. Because hundreds of years later, after Adam and Eve, and after Israel's, Israel's exile and rescue, and after centuries and centuries of human pride, God finally sent a perfect praiser, someone who would worship him completely. And his name was Jesus. He was the Son of God. That means he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No one could be higher, but he humbled himself. He not only comes to rescue the poor, but he became poor. No other God has done that. Jesus said foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He was a wanderer. He was someone who knew what it was like to sleep in the street. But rather than give in to the pride of despair, he shouted, it was for this very reason I came, Father, to glorify your name. So he was high, but he became low. And he was low, but he didn't despair. He was here to praise and worship. And on the last night of his life, after eating the Passover and singing this very song, he was betrayed. He was abandoned by his friends. He was cut off like the childless woman. And he was crucified by the rich and powerful in the ash heap outside Jerusalem because that's where they killed people, in the garbage dump. And on the cross, he paid for every sin and every bit of pride for every time we fail to praise and value him because he values us. He loves us so much that he carried his cross into that garbage dump so that we could be carried to sit with him as royal princes in heavenly places. So don't you see what he did for you and why it matters for how we praise Jesus Christ, who was high above the heavens, came all the way down to the bottom and into death itself so that he could bring you all the way up to the skies. And that's why St. Paul wrote these words to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the reason we can praise God 
in Jesus is because God in Jesus has praised us. He lifted us up, and the reason we can enjoy him is because he put his joy and he found his joy in us. He's valued us so much that he couldn't leave us, but instead he comes down to lift us up. And that, Paul says, is why his name is above every name. And did you hear? His praise will be all time, all places, all people. You and me are invited into that because of what Jesus did in the past and because of us because of his promise for the future, we can be changed and transformed right now. He's going to humble us out of our pride. He's going to love us out of our despair and make us new and make us perfect praisers and enjoyers of God. C.S. Lewis says he will make the feeblest and filthy of us, filthiest of us into a god or goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine, and that's what we're in for. Nothing less. So let's think about how we can just take this with us into the next week and apply it a little bit. As you think about Jesus' love and how it transforms us, I just want to tell you, if, you're, if you don't consider yourself a Christian, we're very glad that you're here. And I'm asking you to think about this Jesus who came all the way down, to lift you all the way up. This psalm is a prayer. You can pray this to God. And then you can talk to somebody here about Jesus and about knowing Jesus. And then the second thing is praising God and truly valuing his name and what he's done. That's going to rescue us from our pride. If you are feeling far from God, at the very bottom there's some sort of pride. And you also need to know that God did it everything to answer that and to bring you back. Nothing is impossible for our God. We can always come to him. That's what Psalm 113 tells us. Third, if you think that someone else is too far from God, or some situation is too difficult, or some part of our city is too broken, there's nothing that's impossible for our God. Amen. We don't have to be optimistic. We actually have hope. And we can pray wisely, we can work hard, and we can do things with this hope because nothing's impossible for him. God came to us in our own problems, our own barrenness, our own ash heaps, and he rescued us. You know, I'm the biggest miracle in the world. You're the biggest miracle in the world. If he can do that, he can do anything. So we can have real hope for our mission in the world. And then finally, if you ever need to be reminded of who God is, the best way is just to praise him. And praise him like Psalm 113 says. Remember his name. What has he done? He is so high, yet he came so low. That's Jesus' story. And he can make it your story. He calls you into his own life. And if you do that, we can sing with the hymn writer, one of my favorite songs, Praise to the Lord. The Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. Come all who hear, now to his temple draw near, and join me in glad adoration. So let's finish by praying together. O oh God, we praise you and we lift you up. We remember your name. We thank you that you came to save. You don't just talk about it, but in Jesus Christ, you did it. And by your Holy Spirit, you're still with us now. Help us to see that the one we praise and the one we enjoy and the one we value, Jesus, is the one who supremely valued us. So send us out now in love and service to our neighbors and to continually glorify and praise your great name. We, praise it in, we pray it in Jesus' name.